Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Put a smile in your smoking. By Chesterfield. So smooth, so satisfying. Chesterfield. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary detail. An elderly woman reports that a man has stolen $300 from her apartment. She says she saw him. Your job? Check it out. Put a smile in your smoking. Next time you buy cigarettes, stop. Remember this. In the whole wide world, no cigarette satisfies like Chesterfield. Put a smile in your smoking. Instantly, you'll smile your approval of Chesterfield's smoothness. So smooth, so satisfying. You want them mild. We make them mild. Mild and mellow. With the smooth and refreshing taste of the right combination of the world's best tobaccos. So next time you buy cigarettes... Stop! Start smoking with a smile with Chesterfield. Smiling all the while with Chesterfield. Put a smile in your smoking, just give them a try. Light up a Chesterfield, they satisfy. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, May 19th. It was sunny in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Bernard. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office, and it was 3.47 p.m. when we got to a small apartment house on the corner of Olympic and 6th, the Topeka Arms. What's that lady's name again, Joe? Dunbetter, Martha Dunbetter. Mm, let's see. Yeah, here's her mailbox, number eight. Must be upstairs. Well, how do you figure that? Only eight mail slots means eight apartments. Yeah? Stands to reason number eight will be on the second floor, don't it? Oh, well, I suppose so. Hey, Joe, I um, wonder who comes from Kansas. What? Well, didn't you notice the plaque out in front? Topeka Arms. Yeah. That's a city in Kansas. Topeka, Kansas. Yeah, sure. Well, somebody must have come from there. The owner or the builder. Why else would they give the place a name like that? I don't know. Well, it stands to reason, doesn't it? I guess so. Well, you see, you're not the only one who can do it. Hmm? Do what? Deduce. Oh. That's what they call it, the way you figured out number eight's the second floor. Deduction. Yeah. I was just giving you an example. When I proved that somebody connected with the building probably lived in Kansas City. Yeah. Right down there. Eight, just like you said. Mm-hmm. Deduction never fails, Joe. Who's there? Police officers. Oh, well, just a second. I'm coming, I'm coming. My goodness, you certainly got back. Oh, well, dear me, you aren't the same ones, are you? No, ma'am, this is Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Well, there were two other policemen here just a little while ago. Shame you didn't know. Could have saved yourself a trip. That's all right, ma'am. We knew they'd be here. They're patrol car officers. They were in the neighborhood, so they answered your call. Oh, well, I... All right if we come in? Oh, my, yes. Oh, yes. Please do. You're Mrs. Martha Dunbetter, is that right? No, not exactly. Oh? It's Miss Dunbetter. I'm still single. I see. Well, ma'am, would you mind telling us just what happened this afternoon? Oh, no, no. I don't mind at all. It's still quite clear. All right, would you go ahead? What was that, young man? I said, go ahead, about this afternoon. Oh, well, now, let's see. I fixed myself some lunch, and then I rid up the dishes. It must have been about one o'clock by the time I finished. All right. Afterwards, I put on my hat, and I went down to the library. It's only a couple of blocks from here, the Grove of Cleveland branch. Mm Mm-hmm. I took back my books and checked out two fresh ones. All right. What happened next? Well, I come home, and there it was. What's that? I come home, and there he was. Who? 
Well, that awful man. Well, just where was he? Here, in my apartment. No, I mean which room? Over there, the bedroom. I see. As soon as I come in, I heard him. At least I heard somebody moving around. First, I thought it was Mrs. Parker's manager. I know she sneaks into my apartment and noses around. Of course, she says she doesn't, but I know better. Mm -hmm. Well, I said to myself, I got her red-handed this time. So I marched into the bedroom all ready to give her a piece of my mind. Well. Well, I was never so flabbergasted in my whole life. He was standing in front of the dresser, going through my pocketbook. I see. My black bag and leather. That's the one he was holding. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, ma'am, how much money was in the bag? Well, I'm not positive. Not to the penny. About $300. In cash? Yes, sir. You see, I've been saving dimes for the past 15 years. You mean this $300 was in dimes? Oh, goodness gracious, no. What I do is go through my change every night and put all the dimes in my dime bank. Then when it's full, I take it down to a real bank and change the coins into bills. A dime bank holds $25. I see. Oh, you'd be surprised how much a person can save that way it mounts up. Yes, ma'am. Do you know the denominations of the bills? I guess they was mostly tens. Maybe one or two bigger ones. Mm Mm-hmm. What did this man do next, Miss Dunbetter? Well, he found the money. My $300. Stuffed it into his pockets. Then he just strolled out of the apartment big as life. I was too dumbfounded to do anything about it. I see. I heard him tramp down the stairs. And then I heard the front door slam. When I was sure he was out of the building, I managed to get my wits together and I dialed Central. Central? The operator. And she put me in touch with the police station. Had you ever seen this man before, Miss Dunbetter? No, I'm sure I never did. Could you tell us what he looked like? Well, he was a tall man. How tall? Big as you, I'd say. Mm-hmm. What color hair, please? Dark. Very dark. Eyes? Dark eyes, too. Dark complected. Like he'd uh, spend a lot of time outdoors. How was he dressed? A shirt and pants and a jacket. Light colored jacket. I think it was green. Did you notice any scars? Yes. Come to think of it. I did. Across his forehead. Thin little ziggity zag. Mm-hmm. About how old would you say he was? Oh, he's young. Thirty-five, maybe forty. You know if anybody else saw him? The other tenants? Well, I haven't talked to him, no. I haven't left the apartment since it happened. You live alone here, do you? Oh, my, no, no. My sister Bessie stays with me. Where is she this afternoon? Well, she went out of town for a few days to visit her grandson and his family. They come down from Oxnard to get her this morning. I see. Tomorrow's her birthday. She'll be 80. I expect they're going to have quite a celebration. Yes, ma'am. You're all carrying on. You'd think it was such an accomplishment. Well, it is a pretty ripe old age, ma'am. I don't see what's so ripe about it. After all, I'm near to 79 myself. Oh, I know I don't look it. Everybody thinks there's at least 10 years between us. And Bessie is failing. Yes, ma'am. Just a couple more questions, Miss Dunbar. Certainly, young man, certainly. What time was it when you got home from the library? 2.45. Maybe a few minutes after. No, later than 3, though. I see. How'd this fellow get into the apartment? Was the door locked? Well, I thought it was. I always try to remember to lock it whenever I go out, but sometimes I do forget. I guess I did today. Mm. You think he'd recognize the burglar if you saw him again? I most assuredly would. Mm-hmm. Nothing the matter with my eyesight. Well, that's fine. We'd like to take you down to the office with us and show you some pictures. No? Just to see if you can identify them. Well, I couldn't go like this. I'll have to change my dress first. Well, I'm all right for walking around in the neighborhood, but not for going downtown. Well, that's up to you, ma'am. Well, the same as done better while I think of it. Uh, who came from Kansas? Oh, I'm afraid I don't understand it. Well, the name of this apartment, you see, is the Topeka Arms, so I figured somebody connected with it must have come from Kansas. Oh. You don't know who it was, do you? Well, now, let me think. Oh, yes, yes, I remember. That was old Mr. Hendrickson's idea. Well, you don't say. Yes, yes, he was the man who built this building. Well, now, that was, uh, oh, goodness sakes, that was almost 35 years ago. My hot time flies. Yes, ma'am. How you like that, Joe? This Mr. Hendrickson came from Kansas. Mm. No, no. Minnesota. Minneapolis, as I recollect. Oh? But it was his idea just the same, calling it the Peak Arms. 
In a kind of an article he read in the newspaper while the building was going up. Yeah. Said there was more people in Southern California who come from Kansas than any other state. Mm-hmm. So Mr. Henderson figured the name Topeka would attract a lot of tenants. It's ridiculous nonsense. Said so at the time. There hasn't been a single solitary one. Oh. Thirty-five years. Not a soul from Kansas has ever lived here. Four oh five p.m. Frank and I put in a call to the crime lab. While Miss Dunbetter changed her dress, we checked the other apartments to see if anybody else had seen the burglar. Only one tenant was in. Mrs. J.T. Blade, apartment six, informed us that she'd been out marketing at the time of the crime and had just returned home. Four sixteen p.m. Lee Jones and the crew from the crime lab arrived. They began their investigation, and we drove Miss Dunbetter down to the city hall. We checked the oddity file and ran the suspect's description and M.O. through the stats office, and they came up with 17 possibles. We pulled mug shots and showed them to Miss Dunbetter. She was unable to make an identification. 6.13 p.m., Lee Jones reported no useful fingerprints or other physical evidence in the apartment. 6.46 p.m., we drove Miss Dunbetter home and we went off duty. The next day, May 20th, 11.17 a.m. I'll get it. Burglary Friday. Who's that? Oh, Sure. Yeah. When'd he come in? I see. Oh? Well, I wouldn't know. What's he look like? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'd like to. Right. Thanks a lot. That was Chubb Starks. Who? You know, Stark, the bartender over at the Yellow Cat. Oh, yeah. What's he want? Guy came into his place last night. He was carrying a pretty big roll. He threw it around, bought drinks for the house. Yeah. Got kind of loaded and did some talking about how easy he'd picked up the dough. Just walked in again this morning. Huh. Sound like anything to you? Well, Chubb says he's about six foot, black hair. Yeah. Scar on his forehead. Put a smile in your smoking. Next time you buy cigarettes, stop. Remember this. It's today's biggest cigarette news. Chesterfield is made the modern way with Accuray. The Accuray controller is the greatest improvement in cigarette making in years, and it's a Chesterfield exclusive. This amazing quality detective electronically checks and controls the making of your Chesterfield, giving a uniformity and smoking quality never possible before. So buy Chesterfield today. For the first time, you get a perfect smoke column from end to end. A perfect smoke column from end to end. From the first puff to the last puff, your Chesterfield smokes smoother. From the first puff to the last puff, your Chesterfield smokes cooler. From the first puff to the last puff, Chesterfield is best for you. Next time you buy cigarettes, stop. Remember, Chesterfield is made the modern way with Accuray. Put a smile in your smoking, just give them a try. Light up a Chesterfield... They satisfy. Frank and I drove out to the Yellow Cat Bar on Figueroa. Chubb Stark, the bartender, pointed out a husky man sitting in a corner booth. We went over to talk to him. Keep your hands on the table and stand up. Huh? Police officers, on your feet. Okay, okay. All right, you can sit down again. Something eating you guys? What's your name? Why? Come on, what is it? Portlong, Ralph Portlong. Where do you live? Hotel around the corner. How long have you been staying there? Since last night. How about before that? Back east, they just got in town yesterday. Whereabouts back east? What kind of a roust is this? Where back east? All over, Chicago, Cleveland, all over. What kind of business you in? Unemployed. You got any money? Some. How much? Look, I ain't no vag if that's what you're getting. How much money you got? hundred bucks, maybe hundred fifty. Where'd you get it? I borrowed it. Who from? Pal. In L.A.? Chicago. What's his name? Johnson, Cliff Johnson. You got his address? I don't know. He moves around, same as I do. How are you going to pay him back if you don't know where he lives? We'll bump into each other. What would you say you got in town, Portland? I told you, yesterday. What time? Six o'clock, somewhere in there. Yesterday morning? Last night. You sure then? Yeah. How'd you come? Train? Car. You own the car? I hitched a ride. Just where were you yesterday afternoon? Riding into L.A. All afternoon? Yep. What was the driver's name? Look, how should I? And I've been hitching for the last week. I must throw with 20 different guys. You don't remember the one you were with yesterday? Nope. Ever been arrested, Portlong? Nothing serious. Well, tell us about it. Oh, drunk, that's all. And where was that? Ohio, when I was a kid. Anything else? Yeah, I got some speeding tickets. You ever been arrested in California? Never been in California. First trip, huh? Yep. 
You ain't exactly making me feel at home either. You know an apartment house called the Topeka Arms? Whereabouts? Six and Olympic. Where's that? In L.A. Look, can't you get nothing straight? I ain't never been here before. Mm -hmm. How about giving me an answer? Why the roust? All right, come on, let's go. What for? We'll show you the site. For instance? City Hall. Frank and I took the suspect into custody for further questioning. 12.16 p.m., we ran the name Ralph Portlawn through R&I. They had nothing on him. We put out an APB with his description stating that he was in our custody. The bulletin requested any information about the suspect and was marked attention Chicago PD and Cleveland Police Department. 2.18 p.m., we again interviewed Portlawn. He insisted he had not arrived in Los Angeles until 6 o'clock the previous evening and refused to say anything more. 4.06 p.m., we received replies to our APB on Portlawn. Chicago reported two convictions for grand theft auto, and Cleveland reported one conviction for burglary second degree. We telephoned Miss Dunbetter and arranged for her to attend a special show-up at the main jail. 6.17 p.m., the show-up was completed, and Frank and I took the victim back to our office. Well, ma'am, you're sure it isn't the same man? My goodness gracious, I ought to know. Yes. I don't see how you could have made such a mistake. Well, he fits your description even to the scar. But I told you it was ziggity-zag. Yeah, you did. This man's scar is entirely different. Yes, ma'am. His hair is wrong, too. Is that right? The other man had some gray in it right across here. I thought you said he was fairly young. But he doesn't have to be old to get gray. I've been gray ever since I had my appendix out. I was only 34. All right. We'll have you taken home now. It's really a shame. Ma'am? You arrested that poor fellow. He hasn't done anything. Burglary Friday. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's right. When'd you get it? No, not yet. Will you notify him? Right. Well, I guess we don't need to feel too sorry for Portlaw. What do you mean? Another answer on our APB. Yeah? You were right, Miss Dunbetter. He couldn't have been your burglar. Well, I told you, didn't I? He was in Needles yesterday afternoon. He hitched a ride. Yeah? Slugged the driver. <laughs> Ralph Portlong was held pending arrival of authorities from Needles. The investigation of the apartment house burglary continued. Two more suspects were brought in for questioning. Both men succeeded in establishing alibis for the time of the crime. Monday, May 23rd, 1.48 p.m. Frank and I were on our way back to the office from lunch. How was your pie? All right. Just okay, huh? I said it was all right. Lemon meringue, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Joe. You should have had apple. Mm-hmm. I told you, stick with apple. You can't go wrong. The lemon was good. You didn't finish it. I was full. Yeah. Well, someday you'll learn. Learn what? Apple pie is always safe. You can't louse it up. Even a bad cook can. Well, I get a little tired of it once in a while, that's all. Well, no reason you should. You can switch it around so many different ways. Yeah, I know. Cheese, malamode, hot sauce. No reason to get tired of apple, Joe. Sure. Hey, Joe. Yeah? I'll call for you while you're out. Oh? Yeah, she wants you to call back. Here's the number. Thanks. Sure. Bessie Maxson. Who's that? I don't know. Mrs. Maxson? This is the police department, Sergeant Friday. Yes, that's right. We were the ones. I guess we can. Well, is something wrong? You sure of that? All right, right away. Thank you for calling. Goodbye. Miss Dunbetter's sister, she just got back from Oxnard. Yeah? She says it never happened. What do you mean? The burglary. Says her sister made it up. Frank and I drove out to the Topeka Arms, and we went up to apartment number eight. It was 217 when we got there. Somebody's coming again. Yeah. Well, what is it? Ms. Maxson? That's right, that's right. Well, my name's Friday. I just spoke to you over the telephone. No. Oh, yes, yes, of course. This is Frank Smith. Oh, how do you do? I do, ma'am. Come right along inside. Yeah, thank you. I just don't know what to say. I suppose it's all my fault for going out of town. Should never have left Martha alone. Might have known she'd be up to something. Are you positively sure about this, Ms. Maxson? About what? About what? That there wasn't any burglary. Oh. Never in a million years. Well, your sister gave us all the details. Play acting, that's all it was, play acting. She's done it all her life. Oh, I see. You mean Miss Dunbetter isn't... My sister is as sane as you are, if that's what you're driving at. 
Well, then why'd she tell us that story, do you know? Haven't got the vaguest notion. She simply won't give me any explanation. Oh, I see. If the story was true, why won't she face me? Why is she hiding? Hiding? The minute I told her I was going to call you, she locked herself in the bathroom. Is that right? Been in there for two hours now. She simply refuses to come out. Well, we'd like to talk to her if we can. Yeah, I'll try again. The fact that you're here may have some influence. Hmm. You think we're getting a run around, Joe? Yeah, it sounds that way, doesn't it? Yeah. Martha? Martha, you come out of there this instant. Martha Dunbecker, do you hear me? The policemen want to talk to you. Now come out. The police are here. I won't. I won't never come out. I never heard of such childishness. You see, I'm not able to do a thing with her. Yes, ma'am. Maybe if you speak to her, she'll come to her senses. All right. Oh, sister carrying on like this. I don't know how I'll ever be able to hold my head up again. It's scandalous. Miss Dunbetter, this is Sergeant Friday. Miss Dunbetter, will you come out so we can talk to you? Miss Dunbetter? Well, it's about time. Whatever were you thinking of, Martha? What got into you? Not speaking to you, Bessie. Let's go into the other room. Be easier to talk there. Yes, sir. Not speaking to me, huh? Well, two can play at that game. And I assure you, I won't be the one who suffers. All right, ladies, would you like to sit down? Now, Miss Dunbetter, uh, can we clear this thing up now? Your sister says there wasn't any burglary. Yes, how would she know she wasn't here, was she? I know because I know you. Yeah. And I know you never had $300 to your name. I did, too. Where'd you get it? Where'd you get it? None of your business. All right, now, how about it, Miss Dunbetter? Did you have $300? Well? Never said it was exactly 300 Not to the penny. Three dollars would be more like it. There happens to be a few things you don't know about, including my savings. A likely story, and you never saved a penny in your life. What about my dime? I shook it the other day. I thank you to keep your hands off my property. Savings, indeed. If I didn't pay most of the expenses around here, you'd starve to death. I managed quite well before you moved in on me, Bessie, and I was perfectly happy living alone. Matter of fact, I preferred that arrangement. But maybe you'd like to try it again. Maybe I would. I'm sure there'd be money ahead. Ha! Don't you hawk me, Bessie Maxim. You ought to see the way she eats. Gobble, gobble, gobble. She shovels it down. Stuff and nonsense. I don't have any more appetite than a bird. Birds don't nip the cooking, Sherry. Martha Dunbetter, how can you say such a thing? Because I know it's true. I marked the bottle. Well, whatever I do, I don't fib to the police like some people I could name. Well, Miss Dunbetter. I made exaggerated respect. Mm-hmm. You mean to do no harm? I wonder if you know it's against the law to file a false police report. Against the law? There. You see... You're going to jail. I knew it would happen. I knew that sooner or later you'd disgrace all of us. Why'd you do it? You must have had a reason, ma'am. I won't tell you. Not in front of her, I won't. Oh. Well, let's see. Would you mind waiting in the other room for a couple of minutes, Miss Maxson? I most certainly would. We'd appreciate it if you would. No, very well. Very well. You think I was the criminal around here? All right, Miss Dunbetter, tell us now, will you? It's very difficult to explain. Well, give it a try, will you? You see, it was all on account of her, Bessie. Go ahead. It started when we was little girls. Just because she's older, she's always lording it over me. Mom and Daddy always gave her everything first. Hand me downs, that's all I got. Bessie's hand me downs. Oh, I see. And when we grew up, I couldn't push myself very much. She's just the opposite, belly the ball. She had a pick of all the young gentlemen in town. The only time they'd take me out was when Bessie was busy. I don't think she didn't let me know that I had second choice. The only reason she married a Horace because he took a fancy to me. Well, I had my pride, too. Wouldn't settle for her leftovers. That's why I stayed single. I see. The least she could have done was name one of her little girls after me. After all, I'm her only sister. Well, Miss Dunbetter, you still haven't told us why you reported the burglary. I am telling you. Yes, ma'am. You're on account of her birthday. Well, that was the last straw. She hasn't talked about anything else for months and months. Just because she's 80 years old, you'd think she was the queen of Romania. A picture in the paper of people making a fuss about her. 
Well, I made up my mind that for once in my life someone was going to make a fuss about me. I see. To tell you the truth, I'm not a bit sorry I did it. I mean, I guess I should be sorry, but I'm not. I really enjoyed myself. And all those questions you asked me, like I was somebody. My name was in the papers, too. First time it ever happened. Kind of strange when you come to think about it to live 79 years without ever seeing your name in print. Oh, but that wasn't the best part. Ma'am? The best part was Bessie not being able to horn in and take all the credit. Oh, I knew you'd find me out sooner or later, but I didn't care. I sure had the laugh on her. All the time she's in Oxnard being parted, I was having little parties of my own. Yeah, well, you know, you didn't need to put us through all this, Miss Dunbetter. You're almost 80 yourself. It's over a year away. When you're my age, you can't be sure of anything. Yes, ma'am. Besides... Even when I'm 80, Bessie will still be ahead. How's that? She'll be going on 90. The story you've just heard is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. On May 26th, the hearing was held in the office of Perry Thomas, city attorney. In a moment, the results of that hearing. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Put a smile in your smoking. Buy Chesterfield. It's the best cigarette ever made for my money. Smooth, satisfying, mild and mellow. Believe me, in the whole wide world, no cigarette satisfies like Chesterfield. Due to the advanced age of Miss Martha Dunbetter, and because of her assurances that she would never repeat her actions, no charges were filed against her. Better schools build better communities. Join and work with your fellow citizens who are actively seeking to improve educational conditions. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Virginia Gregg, Jack Crucian, Helen Cleave. Script by Frank Burt. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely different Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. This is it, L&M Filters. It stands out from all the rest. Miracle tip, much more flavor. L&M's got everything. It's the best. Yes, L&M's got everything. The miracle tip is white, pure white, to give you the purest and best filter. And you get a rich, good-tasting, fully satisfying smoke from L&M's highest quality tobaccos. Buy L&M, America's best filter tip cigarette. It's sweeping the country. One man stands between death and ten people on TV's new dramatic program, Mr. Citizen. See Edward Binns star in the true story, Terror on Jack Rabbit Hill. Check your local TV listings for Mr. Citizen. Hear Dragnet next week, same time, same station. Lux Radio Theater presents Barry Sullivan in Rope of Sand tonight on the NBC Radio Network.